right, guys, welcome back to Reading Genesis with us. If you've been watching and, and you saw the last couple episodes, you know that I teased bringing some slideshows forward from uh, my college days when I was in class learning some Old Testament stuff. Um, so what I did is between last episode and this episode, I actually contacted uh, my professor from that class, Dr. Hall, and I said, hey, Dr. Hall, I'm planning on doing this reading uh, of the entire Bible, and uh, I, your slideshows are already pretty much perfect. There's no reason for me to create some new ones. Would you mind if I use them to help people visually see the things that JD and myself are saying and he he said absolutely uh he loves the idea so i wanted to share that with you guys because we're going to dive into some of these real quick and, and i know that these probably would have been best to start with in the very beginning but we didn't have them but this is going to be some great information for you this is uh uh we're going to go through some stuff that we've already read and then what we're about to read so the final slideshow will be a uh, uh basically a overview of what we're about to dive into as you know i'm here with jd on my side right here uh, JD, I love you, brother. Let's dive into it. So I'm going to open up the first slide here. And we're kind of going back into just an overview of the Old Testament. So uh, there's a lot of things that happen in the Old Testament. And I just want to read through some of these. If you want to take notes, pause it, go back, watch it. That's fine. You've got the period of beginnings. This is obviously when we see uh, Noah, we see a Adam, we see this, this moment in the beginning where all of humanity is the target of God's speech. He's speaking to humanity. But then something happens, and we're going to be reading about that today, where God splits the nations, and then we see the period of the Hebrew patriarchs, right? The patriarchs, the fathers of the Hebrew nations. Uh, then we run into slavery and captivity, where the Hebrews go into slavery. We get to the wilderness and wanderings period, where uh, Moses and the Exodus, and they're out in the wilderness. Then we get to the conquest and the settlement of Canaan period. And then we get to the period of Judges, the United Hebrew Monarchy, the Divided Kingdom, the Babylonian Captivity, and then the, and then the Interbiblical Period. And if you realize something, when you look at the Bible in this overview, again, this is something we've been trying to you know really beat into your head. The Bible is not a book about human history. It's the yeah. story of one bloodline about the coming of Jesus. So look at even this. This is redemption right here. God creates. God selects a nation to bring forth salvation. Salvation comes through the Jews. He then gets those people ready for what's necessary. He allows them to go through persecution, allows them to go through captivity. He then saves them from that. He then guides them to conquer and, and claim what is rightfully theirs. They rebel again. Even though he gives freely, they keep rebelling. So then he has to put them under judges. They has to have a monarchy, a divided kingdom. They fall apart. They fall into captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and then the interbiblical period, which is between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the period That's of beginning, again, this might be, some of you guys might not want all this information, but there's someone out there that wants it. Period of beginnings, we have creation to Abraham. So that's that. We, this is basically what I just said. Uh, there's four different highlights of the period of beginnings. We have uh, the creation period, the fall of man, the flood, and then the confusion of tongues. Um, you, we can obviously go into more details on things, and we kind of already have when it comes to the creation, fall of man, and the flood. And then the Hebrew Hebrew patriarchs, which runs from 2000 to 1500 BCE. Uh, this period highlights four Hebrew men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, there's something interesting here. We all know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph is actually not part of the seed, right? J Joseph's not the seed uh, 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 that, uh, that leads to Christ. But Joseph plays an immense role. That if Joseph doesn't go through what he goes through and does what he does, we don't have David, we don't have Jesus, we don't have anyone, right? So he plays a major function in this period. And we will definitely, I can't wait till we get into that period. I love talking about Joseph's story. Um, I'm trying to think if I want to just leave these up there for people to see because some of this I'm already hitting on. So slavery and captivity, uh, wilderness and wanderings. I'll leave it up there for like two seconds. So if you are want to take these notes, pause it and go back. We're not diving deep on all these things. I just wanted to bring yeah. it up there for you to have. Period of judges. So he, uh, here's all this right here. United Hebrew monarchy. Three main figures of the monarchy are Saul, David, and Solomon. So these are the three kings, and we're going to be going into that. Again, this is a deep overview, and, and we'll be getting into all this stuff later. And then this is the timeline. Again, this is for you to screenshot if you want to have this information for you as we continue uh, into the Old Testament. 
All right. With that being shown, boom, there's the final timeline of everything right there. And that all pretty, JD. I'm glad Dr. Hall let me have this. For some of you watching yeah, this, you're really loving it and, and you're, and you're going to love this. And I will also uh, upload this on Discord. So uh, if you want this, uh, these slideshows, I will upload it on Discord and we will get to that. Now, uh, now for more in-depth of what we already read. So uh, why is the world in such a mess? We discussed this. JD and myself dove into, into the, the curse and all this. But let's look at it a little bit deeper. Uh, it says, because of sin and rebellion of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, four relationships are disrupted as a result of sin. Our relationship with God gets disrupted. We sin against God. Our relationship with humankind, right? What happened? Adam did not provide yeah. and protect for Eve. Eve has this reason not to trust, right? And then God says in the curse that you will be at odds with him, basically. Humanity's relationship with self. We know we had shame. We had guilt. We felt dirty. And then our relationship with the world. God cursed the world so that it would, that it would be by our sweat of our brow that we would um, work and toil the land. Uh, what are the five events in Genesis 3 through 11 that emphasize man's sin and rebellion, right? Because we just finished that. Notice we're on we're on Genesis 11, right? And we're about to read about number five here, the Tower of Babel. But we see Cain and Abel, a brother kills his own brother. Lamech, an introduction of polygamy, which is going against God's order of what marriage is. He creates that in Genesis 2. Uh, genealogy, we see death entering the picture, right? Man was supposed to live eternally. Now we see this person lives, this person dies. This person lives, this person dies. Then we see the flood where God says every intent of the heart was evil. And then we see the Tower of Babel. Uh, uh, um, I'm actually going to expound on what he wrote here. The Tower of Babel is man trying to say, I don't need God. And we'll be talking about that today. In what ways did humankind change after the first sin? I know that I'm familiar with these, but JD, do you want to read these? I'm gonna let you. I, I feel yeah, like I'm taking is, over this, the podcast. Mm. For sure, I can definitely read that. Thanks, brother man. Lost in his original, uh, original innocence. I mean, this is so true. Their open eyes and sudden awareness of a nakedness signify their shame and guilt, as we see in Genesis three seven. Their desire for physical covering reflects the need to hide physically, emotionally, and spiritually. To this day, we see this ring true among all creation. And um, as the devil promised, their eyes were opened. But what they saw produced the first negative emotions in the Bible, guilt and shame. Point number two, their relationship with God was distorted. They lost their immediate and easy access to God's presence. Instead of walking with God, they are now hiding from God. Point number three, Adam and Eve knew good and evil. They now know evil as participants. The knowledge did not make them like God. I mean, that's that's such a good point. We already went over that. So for those of you who haven't haven't, if you if you if this is your first time joining the Bible reading, then I suggest you go back to the very beginning because we we dive into this in quite a bit of detail. To the contrary, the image in which they were made became marred. And that's this is this is a question that that gets answered simply throughout as we go through these these opening chapters of Genesis. They lost the peaceful paradise and freedom of the Garden of Eden. As we see, that was the gates were closed, angels were sent to protect and God the garden. Everything in life is now a burden rather than the intended blessing. How many of us still feel like that today? The effects of the fall carry on to future generations. That's point number five, Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered in the world through one man and death through sin, so also death was passed unto all men because all sinned. Such a deep Buddhist scripture there. So what were the penalties of the sin as we see in Genesis 3, verse 14 through 19? One, the serpent was to crawl on his belly and eat dust of the earth. Two, woman was forced to occupy a place of subordination to man and endure pain in childbirth. And three, man was condemned to a life of toil and suffering. Last one before I give it back to Mike, relationship with the world. Point number one, although our world is wrecked by the effects of sin, God gives hope from the very beginning as we see. His heel will crush the serpent's head in Genesis 3.15. Amen. Amen. 
Now, after that sin entered the world, again, this is an, uh, just a recap of everything we covered and, and, and a good way to help you learn how to take notes. Cain was a jealous individual, had an evil spirit, and was an agriculturalist or a farmer. Remember, I mentioned that he gave the works of his hand. Abel was generous, was reverent in his relationship with God, and was a shepherd. He gave a lamb. A little foreshadow there. Wink, wink. Uh, the first murder in history, Abel's sacrifice to God made in, in spirit of true worship was acceptable. Why that of Cain was not acceptable because it was made in the wrong spirit. Insane with jealousy, Cain slew his brother, thus becoming the first murder in history. Uh, God banished Cain from his homeland. He found a wife, established a race that came to be known as inventors. However, it sadly was also known for polygamy, violence, and murder. Lamech, who is Cain's son, was the first to pursue polygamy. Um, what are the two types of sacrifices in the Old Testament? We see blood sacrifice and then offerings from the first fruits of the ground. Uh, from whom did the chosen people come? We talked about this, right? So pay attention as we're going through Genesis even more. We're going to keep seeing that seed, that offspring. Uh, after Abel uh, and Cain was banished, they had a new child through Seth, right? And Seth is going to be the one that leads um, uh, uh, the next uh, the seed, which leads all the way to Noah, which leads to Abraham, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the Tower of Babel, which we're going to read that before we dive into any more slideshows, right? So I'm not going to go and read the slideshows about the Tower of Babel before we get into the Tower of Babel. Uh, we can come yeah. back to those either at the end of this episode or the next episode. So let's open up the Bible here. And we are at Genesis 11. Um, and, and, and this is where things get a little confusing because there's not a lot of information here. Let me go ahead and put me and JD at the bottom of the screen. But... If as we read, you're going to see moments where we see callbacks, right? So one thing about the Old Testament is you can read the entire Old Testament in chronological order, but in order to do that, you need a plan in front of you and you're going to be bouncing in books, right? Because sometimes a prophet is telling you about something God did and that is actually necessary to know what was happening at that time. Um, you can also read it in the chronological order that the books are written. And then there's also the way that the Bibles are put together, right? Now, for yeah. example... The book of Job doesn't appear in the first five books of the Bible. However, Job is happening synonymously with the story of Abraham and this, this period of Genesis, right? Um, so uh, if you ever are interested in reading the Bible chronologically, like when this is all said and done and over with, if you want to go through this that way, then go search it out and find that, you know, I don't have it in front of me on what that order is. But uh, it's, it's, it's a cool way to read the Bible. But for this series, we're going from Genesis to Revelation, the way that your Bible would re uh, has it portrayed. Yeah, amen. All right, Genesis amen. 11. I don't have my splitter, so I can't see when I'm on screen or not. So you know what? I'm just going to take us off the screen and put the Bible only. Our faces don't matter for this. Um, and I'll start with the reading. So Genesis 11 starts with, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And this verse alone, I actually want to stop here, JD, because um, we can notice now that this is now the actual beginning of this period. See, if uh, I know a lot of people might not remember this, but Genesis 10 starts with, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. And then it dives yeah. into these descendants. But if you read the descendants, it says each one had his own language by their clan and their nations. This is what comes after Babel. This is the, de the these generations to come. And this is an introduction into this period of this life. Right. So because Genesis 11 starts saying the whole earth had one language, we have to know that, OK, well, then these generations are going to come after this because they each have their own language. So basically, Genesis 10 is an introduction to this next portion of Genesis saying, all right, we're about to talk about the generations of the sons of Noah and these are their genealogy. All right. Now to the story. Amen. Boom, Genesis 11 starts. Um, and it says, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Interesting thing here. Interesting thing here. If you go back and read, J.D., you'll notice that when Adam and Eve were sent from the garden, they were sent east. When Cain was sent away, he was sent east. It's almost like when God sends you away, he sends you east. But here we see people coming from the east as if they're trying to come back yeah, yeah, in the yeah. direction of God. Like what well, we're going to come back towards God, but they're not doing it for the right reason. Cause what's about to happen next. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for uh, one another. I'm sorry, brick for stone and bit bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So, Mm. Let's see what's happening right here. 
first and foremost, um, we see an independence from God. They want to build their own city, provide their own protection and their own resources. They want it to be in the heavens. So they want people to look at them and see, look at us, this mighty nation. They, they literally say, make a name for ourselves. And they're also rebelling against the instruction given two chapters ago when God told Noah and his descendants to go forth and multiply. So they're in rebellion against God's command. They are seeking yep. independence on their own and they're seeking their own, uh, 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 Praise and glory. Oh, sorry. I had something in my eye there. Sounds a lot like uh, 2023, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I actually, uh, so JD, sometimes I, I look at it this way. I made it, I remember I wrote a paper on this a few years ago. Um, social media to me looks like the Tower of Babel. Right. What, what yeah. do we see with not just social media, but the metaverse? Right. So God creates the universe. What is universe? Universe. One word. That's actually what universe means. Right. If you break the Latin down one word and God spoke the word of the existence that we live in. But in our generation, people want to separate themselves from God's creation and go into man's creation. The metaverse. Look at my better creation. Look at what I've made better than God. And we all come together in this big town square where we all can coexist at one place instead of being out in love people we're all in this one place and what has happened over the years it is almost like we speak different languages because even if we speak the same language we're talking to walls online because people are convinced that no one can tell me anything so even though we're all speaking the same language online like no this is what i believe it's like we're speaking different languages it, we we have broken our society with the way social media is there's a documentary i saw once called the social experiment or something i don't know what it was called yeah um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But all the original people that helped create like Google and YouTube, like they're not involved in it anymore. And they're straight up like we we did something we shouldn't have did. Like it's, it's and, and people and the interviewers were like, OK, but how do we stop it? And they're like, no, you don't get what I'm saying. It's 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 unstoppable now. Humanity is now like we're cyborgs. And the way they explain it is we're cyborgs that just don't have a proper connection yet. We're still limited by our thumb. Even Elon Musk said this. He said, the only thing that slows you down from being advanced is your, is your thumb speed. How quick can you search something? But once we break the thumb, uh, break the thumb, break that, that break, that, 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 uh, that interference with the thumb and yeah, get it from yeah, here yeah, to yeah, here, yeah, yeah. we're basically walking at, uh, cyborgs. We all have a, a device that we walk with that is our connection to the world and we are connected to it. People be like, Amen. imagine, bro, I'm sorry. I know I'm venting. Imagine if people treated their Bibles the way they treated their phones. Like if you left your house without it, you're like, oh, hold up, bro, 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 bro. <laughs> I, bro, bro. We, we, we all have the same idea, man. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm so there with you, but imagine you just, imagine you knew, imagine you knew the verses Imagine you knew the scriptures as well as some people know their favorite NFL team and who's running the linebacker and who's the running back and who's the quarterback. And, you know, like the way people know their sports, if they knew just like a couple of Bible verses, the way they knew their sports, man, oh man, oh man, we, we would have a generation that's on fire for God because like right now it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll get to my Bible. I'll, I'll get there. When I get That's what makes me so sad, bro, because those same people, and I was one of them, act like, oh, I really, I'm just really not good at reading the Bible, and I really am not good at memorizing verses, but I could tell you every player on the Seahawks. I could tell you the stats from four years ago. Did you know we were the number one defense for four years straight when it comes to scoring defense, allowing less than 15 points per game, which is was, was immensely incredible from 2011 to 2014? How dare I have that knowledge and not put that same priority into the Bible, right? Yeah. People that yeah. can literally, a song can come on from 20 years ago and you be in the car talking about um, bop, doop, dop, Stop doing that. Like, you know, all the words. Do it up, I do up, do but yet have the audacity to say, man, I just can't memorize. I can't, but the Bible's just, you know. No, it's yeah, not a priority. Yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah. No, I feel you there. Yeah. Um, the best is like, have you seen that? Have you seen, sorry, I'm going to digress just for one more second, but have you seen... <laughs> Have you seen? Have you seen that those, those dudes that go like from like Walmart and Target and stuff, and they're like, "We'll give you twenty dollars or fifty dollars if you can quote a Bible verse." Yeah, I've and seen then, stuff like that. Yeah, man, and then like you get some people they're like, um, "For God so loved the that He can do all things through me," and 
I'm I'm the one who is come to do the things through. And it's like, yo, dude. It's like taking like four or five different verses and mash them into one. It's it like so, it bucks makes for... me so sad, honestly. It makes me so sad. It, I know I laugh about it because sometimes all you can do is yeah. laugh, but man, it, may, it breaks do. my heart. That people that claim to know him and love him don't don't even give him the time of day. If you're listening to this mm. Bible study, as we begin this Bible study, I want to challenge you to do something. If you've been on any of my live streams, you might have heard me say this before, but this was an eye-opening experience for me. Take a it's, it, in, inventory your life uh, uh, today. Yeah, Write down what you do every hour. That's it. Just well, hey, for this hour I watched Netflix. For this hour I worked. For this hour I worked. For this hour I worked. For this hour I spent some time scrolling on TikTok. Do that for a couple of days, maybe one day, two days, whatever it is, and just look at where your time is spent. And those are your priorities, the top values. If you spent the majority of your time working with your family and Netflix, those are your priorities. Now I'm not knocking working or family because they're necessary, yeah, yeah, yeah. but Netflix, like, like, and you might be like, well, Mike, how do I, how do I give so much time to God? You want me to just be in prayer for eight hours? No, 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 no. Because I can be doing things, but my mind is centered on the Lord. I can be taking time to study, taking time to pray. I can be with my family is also a way that I serve the Lord. I'm not sitting here saying it has to look exactly like time with God, time with family, time with work. But to open your eyes to the realization of what you actually put your time into. Time is unattainable once it's used. It's gone once it's used. It's a limited supply, and we never know how much of it we have. That is the most precious commodity you have. So what you invested in is your priority. Like that's the greatest way to know somebody's priority. Period. Yeah, take stock, man. Take stock every day. Take stock because I tell you how quickly this thing creeps up on you, where where you think you're on top of things, and you go for, you, you can go from reading your Bible every single day for like four or five hours every single day to three hours, two hours, one hour, none. Bam, and it happens quickly. It happens quickly. So, this like, is why my recommendation is always to read the Bible daily, not because I think that you can actually achieve that without making m mistakes and coming up short, but because if we come up short on daily, then you miss the day. But if you say, I'm going I'm to read the Bible once a week, when you miss that, you miss the week. We know what, as humans, can I just mm, be mm, honest mm. with you guys joining us? As humans, Sad. you know you're going to fail at everything you do at least once. So therefore, always aim higher than you're actually trying to go. Because if you come up yeah. short on a high expectation, you still meet a certain level, right? If you tell someone, do this in 12 minutes, they might get it done in 12 minutes and 30 seconds because they just missed the deadline. But if you tell them 10 <laughs> minutes, they might get it done at 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Same task. But the, when yeah. you see the deadline or when you see the finish line, it actually creates a drive in you. There's a study where they put people on treadmills. And like when you actually give somebody a something to aim for, they actually exert themselves higher. They, they do it better. Like it's naturally comes easier because they see something, a finish line, set targets that are just slightly above what you think you can achieve and aim for that. Aim, go beyond the finish line. Always aim through it. I can do analogies on this all day long. Let me keep reading the Bible. Where are we at? Verse uh, 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 five. And the wow. Lord came down. To see the city and tower. Look at that, JD. God ain't just watching yeah. in the sky. He said, Let me go down. Man, what did they let me go down here and see this little weak little tower there that they putting up, <laughs> which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. I have that word one highlighted. JD, do you think you know why that word one is highlighted? A God. A God. Look at that. So here's God saying, these are one people, the same one that says the Lord thy God is one. I, last I checked here, I'm talking about a large group of people here. Large group of people, but they're one. They have come together. In unity. In unity. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hebrew. <laughs> um, oh, 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 oh. Whenever I close the Hebrew, it makes my thing go crazy. Behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and, and go down there 
and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, I know a lot of people here want to see, let us go down there, and you think he's talking about the Trinity. That's not what I, I see here, because let us go down means that they're going, they're coming into this world. We know that the Father, Jesus is not about to say, Father, come, let us go down, because Jesus is with the Father. God mm. uses his heavenly hosts. God uses, just like God uses us, he uses his heavenly hosts. We see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. He sends he sends his uh, his beings, his angels. His yeah, it's the same as the uh, it's the same as where we go back to Genesis one, where he says, "Let us make man in our image." Again, we've we've both recommended Michael, Doctor Michael Heiser. Um, he's got a book on this on on that specific, you know, the the oneness of God and you know his heavenly hosts. Yes. Amen. Amen. And we can talk. We're going to be definitely talk about that more later as we get to some certain passages that I know are going to bring up yeah. questions for you. And it says, um, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So God here sees that when man is united in these levels of numbers, evil will come. Well, what do we see later on? We see later on in human history that we have large groups of people that do the same thing. We see uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, and all that. I, I mess up his name all the time when I pronounce it because a large group of people, like he said, can do anything that they aim to do, and men aim to do evil, right? So God isn't putting a cease to this capability. He's postponing it because why? Because God is escorting in the future, right? Maybe this is unrelated. I'm about to digress. Can I talk about something I was realizing last night as I'm deep in prayer, JD? Yeah, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. about how these prophets and, and, and these people write the Bible, right? And I, I wonder if we ever really deeply think about what biblical divine inspiration looks like. And I bet there's some people out there, bro, that think that it, what it is is, and I know you can't see me. I'm not on camera for you. But it's almost like this prophet is just sitting at the table and then like he starts like convulsing and then his eyes are on the back of his head and then the Holy Spirit just speaks to him and he's just sitting there writing. And then he finishes it and yeah. be like, oh my goodness, what did I write? I don't believe that's what divine inspiration is. Let me share with you what I believe divine inspiration is. I believe divine inspiration is someone who God groomed from childhood to adulthood exactly for a mission so that when they begin to write, they would write what God has allowed. And, and, and depending on how they write and what they write, what does God even, uh, what does Jesus say to uh, Peter? Will you bind on earth? I bind in heaven. Like he allows us to play the part in delivering this message. So when we see these archaic rules, God is guiding men through archaic times. It's not that God is planning on forever having it where if, if you marry someone and find out she's not a virgin and then she has to be stoned. And if you lied about her being a virgin, then you get whipped. No, it's archaic people working through an archaic time and God is molding them through this time, through his will and allowing us to grow and allowing us to learn and allowing us to Praise get Jesus, to a man. place that we need to be. Amen. And Praise that's why I believe we see uh, things that Moses shares and, and Jesus refers to it. Moses said, but I said. So that means Jesus is pointing to the fact that I backed Moses because these laws were official, but that still had a piece of Moses in it because he was delivering you this message. What I say is this. Again, I'm not saying that Moses isn't delivering the word of God. He is. But Jesus is saying the proper way to say it is this, right? And we see this here which tells me that Jesus is saying, like, let me explain to you what not even Moses could comprehend and tell you. Because he told you don't murder, but I'm telling you if your heart is con is convinced that you want to commit murder, like you hate someone, you've committed murder in your heart, right? So I believe mm -hmm. God speaks through his prophets divinely, and when, he, and when his prophets speak, he says, I back those words because that's my prophet. But yeah, I do yeah, believe yeah, yeah. that when it's divinely inspired, the man's... Uh, that man that was chosen by God and groomed by God has an, has his natural influence, if that makes sense, right? And we see that through the archaicness of mankind as it guides through the Old Testament, as we go through this yeah. Old Testament. So my bad on that. I know that was a little sidestep, a little something I was thinking about last night when it comes good to side step, the Good sidestep, good sidestep. No, that just, that just when, you die, when you go off, then I, you, you say a lot that makes me want to say something back. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 you go. So I just want to add to this. This is something quite profound because when you look at the prophets throughout, throughout the Old Testament, every single time they, 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 they say what? Thus says the Lord or so says the Lord. Um, you know, the Lord has spoken. Uh, the Lord has said. 
And, and this is, this is what we, what we don't see. And, and for those of you who don't watch the podcasts on Mondays and Wednesdays, please, you know, consider doing so. But when we go, when you go back to that episode on that, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, notice how none of these prophets are speaking to individuals, financial needs, health needs, um, monetary, children, household, none of this, none of this. They are speaking, they are confronting a nation about its sin and it needs to turn from that sin. This, all of the prophets, all of the prophets are addressing the same issue. And you never see, bro, a confusion. It's <laughs> thus says the Lord. This is what God said, not... I was talking with the Lord this morning and I, he put something there and I had to go to the dictionary and look it up. And when I looked up this word, I realized what God was trying to say to me was God ain't giving you hints to like, Hey, I'm going to yeah. whisper some nonsense to God's you. I want you to figure God. out what I'm saying. God gives you word. That's why you have the, that's why a prophet can say, thus says the Lord. He said this. Yeah. Yeah. Period. <laughs> um, Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. Uh, uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, uh, okay, okay. Verse eight. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all of earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. And Babel is an interesting word. It obviously means the, to speak things that don't make sense. And also it, it, it is, ha, it shares a root commonality with Babylon. Actually, there's actually a deep connection there. I don't know off the top of my head, Amen. so I couldn't answer that for you if I wanted to. Now, what I want you to do though, is I want you to keep something in the back of your head here. Something beautiful is happening here. And we're going to learn more about it in Deuteronomy 32. We're going to learn more about it in the new Testament. But prior to this point, like I said, the Bible is being, uh, we see the Bible being directed to all humans, right? God created humanity and this is, and he judges humanity, right? So you see him judging the world. After this point, judgment isn't, uh, uh, you see kind of this like, let them be them. You're going to stand apart from them, right? So prior to this, the world is evil. I punish the world. After this, it's you guys be different than the world. You guys don't be like the world. He's going he's gonna to take a nation of his own to mold, to, to use, to bring forth his oracles, to bring forth his word, and then bring forth his seed. Now, here's the coolest thing, though. So that means prior to the Tower of Babel, all of humanity, he looked at like your mind, listen to me. And then at Babel, he disowns the nation saying, you know what? Go. And we see later in Deuteronomy 32 that we're going to get to, he gave those nations to the sons of God. That's what it says. It says that he gave those nations to the sons of God and kept one for himself. Well, as we've discussed and as we're going to learn, the sons of God are these angels to be watchmen over people, right? That's what we, we see in the scriptures. Well, we also know that these other nations ended up worshiping these watchmen, worshiping these, uh, these angels, and therefore we see these false gods. On top of that, he disowns all the nations to keep one, my nation. And then he brings mm -hmm. Jesus forth. And what happens at Pentecost? So at Babel, he breaks the nations, separates them, and breaks their language so they can't understand each other. Jesus dies, raises from the grave. And at Pentecost, all the nations were present in Jerusalem. It actually says it. They, they were there for, for, community, for traveling and for commerce. So all these nations are present. They're called back to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes and brings the tongues of flame that they can speak other languages. So no longer are they divided by language. The gospel can be spread to all. And through Christ Jesus, you have the right to become adopted. So in Babel, he disowns the nations with a plan of redemption to readopt them one day. And Pentecost is the fulfillment of Babel. So, it, and, and from this moment on, we're going to see little hints of the calling back of Gentiles, even in Psalm 22, when it says they will return and remember the Lord. So if anyone tells you that the Bible is for Israel only and that salvation is for Israel only, they have no idea what they're talking about. Israel's plan, I mean, Israel's uh, a purpose from day one was to bring forth redemption for the world. Amen. Okay. okay. Amen. <laughs> I'll let you take over uh, with generation. Oh, uh, yeah. Good show, bro. <laughs> You're welcome, brother. This is what I'm here for. Go ahead. Read them generations, bro. <laughs> ain't, ain't no love like brotherly love. Just switch to a wine pigeon for me, if you wouldn't mind. Shem's I'll do it, bro. I'll do it. 
<laughs> gems, descendants. Now, again, genealogies, we get caught up on the genealogies. Yes, they, they are generally boring. We're not going to even try, and, but there is method. There is method to what God is trying to show us. And again, he's trying to show us that the, that the bloodline from the start to Christ is 100% by his hand. And this is what we see. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad. Arpachshad. Um, and let me just quickly open up here. Two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah and Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he had fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. So here we see again, just want to point this out, other sons, other daughters, but the bloodline, this is why it's so imperative to take note of the fact that there are other sons and daughters, but these are the ones that are directly related. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. Notice how the ages are getting younger and younger. 29 years, he fathered Terah, and Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Terah had lived 70 years, there jumps massively, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So there we see Abraham, or Abram, Nahor, and Haran. That is the correct pronunciation for those. Terah's descendants now in verse 27. Now, here's where, gets, here's where we get into who Abraham is. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. So there we see Abraham's cousin. Haran died in, in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. In Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abraham and Nahor took wives, and the names of Abraham's wife was Sarai, which later, as we will see, becomes Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife is Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and Iska. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. So here we see this confirmed again early on in the scriptures. Terah took Abraham. Uh, his son and Lot, his son Haran, his grandson and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his sons, his his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Oh, I want to. I want to. I want to throw something here that that uh, maybe you've never heard before. It's something that um, actually my college professor from my Old Testament survey pointed out for me, and then now I can't unsee it. So we see Abram becoming Abraham, and and, and as we yeah. just discussed, the the Babel happened, and now he's going to yeah. select a nation of his own, which is Abraham, right, the father of the nation, right. So this is a it's setting it up for that, and. Abram's promised Canaan, and he sent, and that's his mission. He's sent to go to Canaan. God says, go to Canaan, right? And that's what Abraham gets. And that's, and by doing that is also him fulfilling what God asked him to do and getting is the reason why he is the father of the nations. Notice here, though, in verse um, 31, it says that Terah was taking his family to Canaan, but they never made it. They landed in Haran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it brings up something for, that I want you to think about. We often think 
What if someone says no to God or doesn't do what God asked them to do? What if God, someone doesn't accomplish what God asked them to do? Well, then your son might be the one or someone might. Because what if God asked Terah to go to Canaan and he never made it? And that's why God's not revealing anything about Terah to Moses. Because Terah didn't finish what he asked him to do, but his son did. What if Terah was meant to be the father of all nations, but God knew that Terah wouldn't make it, so therefore Abram was sent. But Terah was originally sent to begin the journey for Abram, to, to build Abram to be the man that he's supposed to be. There's so much to see right here when you see that they were on the way to Canaan before God tells Abraham to take his people to Canaan, which leads me to believe that either it's coincidence or Terah most likely had some instruction. Because remember, this is the same bloodline. Terah is the father of Abram, right? Just something yeah. interesting here that God's will will be done. Like we see it Amen. in the Bible nonstop that God's will will be done. So if God asks you, person listening, to go forth and do this, if you don't do it, it doesn't tarnish God's plan. It just affects the fact that you didn't uh, do what God asked you to do. But someone's going to do it. Someone's going to do what God has planned. Like that's Amen. not going to stop. His will will be done. Our privilege is that we want to be a part of his will. Because if you're, if you don't do what God asks you to do, then there's blessings that you might not receive. Cause let's just say hypothetically, Tara was offered the same thing and Tara didn't make it. That means Tara is not the father of the nations as Abraham is. He's not blessed with the, with that title and with that role because he didn't do what God asked him to do. Now that doesn't mean Tara is lost or anything. He still was a believer and follower of God. But see, there's extra blessings. I will bless you. I will uh, multiply you. I will make you a father of many great nations. There are things in life that God does want to bless you with. Like, I don't want people to think that we're anti-prosperity uh, when it comes to God's true prosperity. We're anti the lazy manifest prosperity. <laughs> if yeah, you yeah. pursue God, you will find prosperity in what God wants to be prosperous to you with. Because it's not what the world wants. It's the thing, the blessings that God has. And it comes from us being faithful. We see this with what Jesus tells us when he says that he will give to you your wages for the labor that you put in. All right. So just something interesting there, but I didn't want to stop you. Go ahead. You can keep reading, bro, because I gave you the generations. How dare I? How dare I? <laughs> and do we also see the first, we, we also see the first example of born again here, yeah? like Abraham turning into Abraham. And Sarai turning into Sarah. I mean, it, it, it's the parallels are beautiful. I, I, I just love it, man. I just love it. Chapter 12. Here we go. So for those of you who are following along or listening along, if you've just joined, go back <laughs> and don't skip ahead. This is your warning. I'm actually going to, we're going to plant little, little seeds in and among these podcasts, and we know, oh, did you hear the warning? <laughs> this is where JD says, if you've skipped to this point, go back. So chapter 12, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Oh, my so goodness. So Abraham went. There's I mean, so yeah, much I, I, I paused for a reason because I was like, <laughs> you're going to want to add something. Well, no, just mainly because even in this blessing, look at what's being promised. He tells him that he'll be a, a, a father of a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great, right? But then he says, in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Christ is going to come through this lineage. The redemption mm, of mankind mm, is going mm. to come through this lineage. This isn't a blessing of in Abraham that, you know, all these people are going to receive money one day or wealth or prosperity. No, redemption. <laughs> Redemption. And this is why it is beautiful to know the New Testament when you go into this. Because Galatians 3 is is if if you're reading if you've watching this with us and you're a Christian and read the Bible, go pause it real quick. Listen to me. Pause it real quick, I promise you. And go read uh Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, go read Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 3, and then come back and and and, and see how Paul's knowledge of what's going on here is about to blow you away. 
And don't worry, JD and myself are probably going to include a lot of it in here. But I'm going to scroll down so JD can keep reading the story of Abram as I walk away for two seconds. So I trust him to uh, uh, get up to this part right here where we're going to talk about some stuff. Amen. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and a lot went with him. So as we've already seen, that lot is Abraham's family. Lot is of his um his cousin, I think his cousin or nephew, his nephew. There we go. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot with his Lot, his brother's son. So there we go, his nephew, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward Negev. Oh man, it's all about perfect timing for me to walk back here um, and just catch the end of it. Oh man. <laughs> So as you all see, I have highlighted verse seven. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. Now, for those that paused this and went and read this, uh, I, I have offspring highlighted for a reason, because Paul points out to us. And this could also say seed, depending on your translation that you're using. But notice it's a singular and not a plural. It's not talking about people. It's talking about one offspring, and that is Jesus, because Jesus is given the land. Jesus is given dominion. Jesus is given rule. Jesus is given all by the Father. We see in Daniel 7's prophecy, which we will be getting to um, uh, if you're new here. I mean, if, we're, if, we're, if you're traveling from the beginning of the Bible with us. But the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days and is presented a kingdom, a nation uh, to rule and to be over. Right. So this is Jesus. And if you are in Christ, this becomes your heir as well, your promise. And this is the promise that comes before the law. So this is the promise given immediately to the people in Christ. This is the first promise for those that are in Christ. So prior to this, the gospel message was only this. Ready? Remember, we talked about what the gospel is, the good news. And we said in Genesis 3, the good news was announced that someone's coming to crush the serpent's head. That's all you know right now. Well, here comes the, an expounding of the good news. Also, a great blessing to the whole world will come with my promise. And Abraham's offspring will receive this blessing, right? So now we have the good news that someone's coming. It's going to crush the serpent's head and it's going to be a blessing. That's all we know now, but it's a promise. And, and, and we see Abraham's going to trust this promise. And also, I want you to remember something as you're reading before I give it back to JD. Moses is writing this. Okay, this is coming during the time of Exodus. So Abram doesn't have scripture. Abram doesn't have the information that we have. So think about the tr the level of trust. When it says later in, New in the New Testament that Abraham's faith is the example for us, that Abraham's faith is the beginning faith, the faith that saves is the Abraham faith. There's no Bible. There's no testimonies written down saying God did this, God did this. All he's got is his father's obviously teaching, you know, that, you know, our forefathers told us that God or whatever they might have called in that day, because he hasn't even revealed his name yet. The most high has done these things, but that's all he knows. He doesn't, he doesn't have what you have. Think about that. You have all this and people reject him today. Abram's faith was you're speaking to me. And I trust that you are the God that you say you are. I trust that you can keep the promise you say you keep. We have a cloud of witnesses that shows God keeping his promise. Abram trusted God at his word without knowing the promises that God's already kept. So when we talk about that faith of Abraham, 
It's a faith that trusts. Like when I say trust, I mean trusts because we have so much more to give us reason to trust. And yet so many people's trust today is faulty or, or not strong. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Leaning on our own understanding. That's what it always comes back to. Like, Amen. You, and and you, this you, is the, also the first thing we're going to see here with Abram is something we're going to see a lot with a lot of people in the Bible. Uh, I was I quoted this the other day on my uh, on my story because as we've been planning for this pro- podcast and doing this, one of the things I realized, JD, is the Bible is not full of extraordinary extraordinary men. Right? We we often think about how the Bible has all these extraordinary yeah, yeah, men. Yeah, yeah. No, it has a Amen. bunch of wicked men with an extraordinary yeah. God behind them. And Amen. Well, what we see from the moment of Abraham all the way through, uh, uh, you know, up until Jesus comes, not including Jesus, but up until him is men that God has to walk through some stuff before they start leading. Right. We live in a yeah. time where people come to the Lord and one week later they want to be online teaching people the Bible. People that want to and they'll, they'll ask you, how do I get like you? They'll ask these pastors. They'll ask body. They'll ask Paul Washer. They'll ask James White. They'll ask their whoever it is. How do I get like you? What I have to read. And if you go to the Bible, what you see are people being walked through things to get to where they're at. God build yeah. you through the things that you need to go through. Uh, what do you need to do to get to the point of leadership? Live some. Live. It's it's not yeah, an overnight thing. Some. And then some. Because watch, <laughs> and then watch some. what we're about to go into with Abram before he even really does what he has to do. Um, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. Look at look at Abram with the uh, little, hey, baby. Hey, look, I just want to remind you, you're beautiful. <laughs> We about to go up in here, and, and they and they and they gonna see that you're beautiful. I see you, Abram. Abram, I see you. <laughs> and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, "This is his wife." Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. I'm about to tell my wife that, baby. We gotta be careful when we go out here. You know, people want to kill me to have you. That's a slick one, good one, Abram. I appreciate you there. Uh, <laughs> say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared. For your sake. You know what's sad, JD? I see yeah. people that will quote parts where the people say Abraham's sister is his wife and be like, see, Abram married his sister. If you actually yeah, read the yeah, Bible, yeah. you would see Abram told Sarai to say she was his sister. And you're about yeah. to also say, wait a minute, so Abram lies. Yes. Yes. And, and he lies. An it's fallible. <laughs> God doesn't allow your lie, even if your lie benefits you, but he'll still use this person. Like you see this, right? That fallible man using a lie to protect himself. It's a lie though. It's a lie, but God still uses him because he's, he's a fallible human. So if you make mistakes and you, and you fall and you sin, it's not that God's about to take his hands off you trust him. And it says, uh, uh, say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful And when the princess of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? So remember what I said? God's still going to use you. Abram lied, though. And what comes from it? Things get a little bit more sticky, right? God's not going to let you, like, hey, I'm going to use you, but I'm going to, here's that. People say, what does it look like to be chastised by the Lord? Genesis yeah, 12 yeah, right here. Yeah. You're about to see it. Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her as, uh, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and, and go. So Abram literally was about to give up his wife for safety here, in a, in a sense, but God obviously knows the purpose here. I need Sarai because I'm going to have a seed go through her. Abram, why did you lie? I'm about to put this on Pharaoh's heart, right? So God's going to have his will done. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. That's the end of chapter 12. Let's go ahead and roll into chapter 13. But just, I mean, I don't, anything you want to touch on from chapter 12 there uh, that we ended with, J.D.? No, just, just, just spot on again, you know, when it comes to the apologetic side of things. You know, oh, 
So Abraham, Lot, yeah, he's fallible. He's, he's a man like us, 100%. David, David murdered. David lied. <laughs> Samson broke every single one of the commandments God told him not to break. Every single one. <laughs> like people go, oh, Samson cut his hair. Like, no, he did everything God said not to eat. He like, he ate from a dead carcass. He, he, he ate honey from a lion carcass. Like he wasn't supposed to do that. He wasn't supposed to do this. He wasn't supposed to do that. He did all of it. So ultimately we, we see a beautiful picture of, 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 of just backing up exactly what you said a minute ago. We see in the Bible that, that we see fallible human beings, fallible men with lots of issues backed by a perfect God. That's the bottom line. He is perfect. And my apologetics brain is now thinking too. Another thing to remember here is this is actually something that you should want to see. So this shows that this is historical narrative. Why would the Bible show that these people are fallible and fallen and their mistakes? When people try to act like the Bible's made up, why would they include some of the embarrassing things they did? Like Peter's over there making up the New Testament, like, hey, make sure y'all put in there that I was a coward and I ran away from Jesus. And hey, you know how women's testimony doesn't mean anything? Have it so the women find Jesus from the grave, uh, find his grave empty. Oh, and, and go ahead and put in there that Stephen got stoned, hit in the face with a rock. And he, yeah, he, he just died right there, didn't even defend himself. Oh, and put in there that David's, like, you know what I mean? Like, the, the, the truth is in here, it's historical narrative. Like, oh, God allows polygamy? No, people committed polygamy. Oh, God allows people to do X, Y, and Z? No, it's just truth. It happened. It happened. If it was taken out, you would be the, the same people arguing against the truth in scripture would argue if yeah. the truth was kept out of scripture. They don't know what they want. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So chapter 13, uh, Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that they had and lot with him into Negeb or Negeb. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Geb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord and Lot who went with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possession were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the uh, Perizzites were dwelling in the land. So real quick, just to show here, because again, we want when we're, re when we're doing this Bible reading, we want to create this picture in our head. We've got this journey from Adam all the way to here, and God cleans the earth, and then Noah's descendants, and here's Abram trying to be obedient to God, and he travels to Egypt, and he travels back to this location, and now his people are growing. His people are growing, and he's not yet where God sent him at, so there's no room, and, and these people are people. They're sinful people. Like when you put people together, you're just putting a bunch of sinners together. Same thing with marriage. Marriage is just two sinners coming to live together and when you have kids it's two sinners trying to raise sinners like there's always going to be headbutting and we see this here between abram's livestock uh people uh, herdsmen of the livestock and lots uh herdsmen of the livestock and then it points out that at this time also you've got canaanites and the parasites so people that are going to be at odds with them so in verse eight then abram said to lot let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen for we are kinsmen is not the whole land before you separate yourself from me. So he's saying, bro, we family, we love each other. It's plenty of land here. Back up. <laughs> if you exactly. take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah little foreshadow so lot chose yeah, for yeah, himself yeah. all the jordan valley and lot uh, journeyed east thus they separated from each other abram settled in the land of canaan while lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as sodom now the men of sodom were wicked great sinners against the lord so i'll stop there and let you add anything that you might want to add yeah that's that's exactly it and yeah i love the way it foreshadows that I love, I love the way it foreshadows that because, and, and here's the thing, people miss this. So why is Moses doing this? 
and and this is this is okay. Why is yes? If it's foreshadowing something, you've got to ask the question why. And this is why you dig in. Remember, as as Mike had already mentioned, that this is this is Moses writing about what God had revealed to him. What happened? That that's that's all I want to add on that piece there. Is is why is it foreshadowed? And you'll see now why. Which is. <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, think about this. Imagine you're in Israel. You just got out of Egypt. You just escaped on the Exodus. And you know things about your history from, again, what I say, the father's passing on information. So when he says this, Moses is saying these things. Imagine God doesn't say that. They'd be sitting there like, wait, is this after? Because we know about Sodom and Gomorrah getting destroyed. I guarantee you that that's been passed down from generation to generation about God raining down fire upon a city and destroying it, right? So they're sitting there. So now it's being known. By the way, this is before I destroyed it. So now you now you understand where Lot's going, right? Do you understand now, children? When I tell you Lot went to this location, now that they, they know that this is before Sodom and Gomorrah's destru- destruction, they're probably looking at it like, oh, 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 we about to find out something, huh? We about to, oh, wait a minute. Let me sit up in my chair real quick. Let me get comfortable, right? Because they're about to learn something because Moses is revealing the power of God and what God has done. Because also another great thing to picture here. These people just got saved by Moses. Well, not Moses, but sorry. Sorry, Lord. Saved by God through Moses. And God's about to instruct them with law and a nation and, 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 and to be together. But beforehand, he's showing all the areas of my mercy and my wrath. Know who I am. Because what does he also reveal to Moses and the people? His name. This is a moment of know who I am. I am about to show you who I am. I am that I am. I am that I am. I am a God of my covenants. I keep my word and my wrath is full because in today's Amen. society, there's this weird idea that God is only love. God is not only love. He is love, but he is also wrath. Like when atheist says, oh, your God's really loving who punishes non-believers." No, my God is also a consuming fire, right? So no, he's mm-hmm. not just all love. You're right. He loves <laughs> to the utmost to those who he loves. But he also shows justice and wrath to those that he shows justice and wrath to. Let us not forget Mm. that. And from the beginning of any type of preaching, because Moses preaching, this is the first preaching we see, like, really giving some word because he's giving this information to Israel. Like, just like we're reading this together, Moses would have been on the side of the mountain being like, I spent these days with the Lord. Look at what I'm about to share with you. Right. Let me tell you who God is. I mean, that's that's also just just quickly, just to add to that. When people say that, you understand that God's love cannot look upon wickedness. His His love cannot look upon wickedness. He can't see what's happening in in in, in the world today and go, "Oh well, I love that." In in in, in the the prophet Isaiah makes it very clear. That, God grows angry with the wicked every day. Hmm. He grows angrier and angrier with the wicked every day. So he's slow to anger, slow to wrath. Doesn't mean that he isn't those things. And again, this is, this is a common misconception of what love is. You see, and this comes right back to why it is a problem when you distort what love is. If, you've, if you've got a twisted idea of what love is, You'll never understand God. If you've got a twisted or distorted view of love, you will always have a twisted and distorted view of God. Ooh, it's, it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bumper sticker right there. That's if you have a twisted <laughs> or distorted view of, you know what? I know that this is, this is normally a podcast thing, and this is the Bible reading today, but I, I think it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> People read, well, this is a bible reading what in the world we out here air horning it yeah we air horning it for that one um uh, let's see where we at time wise we can keep going yeah we got time uh verse 14 yeah. the lord said to abram after lot had separated from him lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are north northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. Mm, There's that word again, offspring, not offsprings, your offspring forever. Who gets this land forever? Jesus, because he's eternal. I will make your offspring 
offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted, right? Because how many people are in Christ? I couldn't even imagine that number. I mean, there's 7 billion people on the planet today and supposedly 2.4 billion are Christian. Uh, so even if half of those are actually Christian, in today's era, we got 1.4 billion people in Christ, right? And that's just today. Right, the the numbers in Christ is probably immense. I know that we like to imagine it like it's me and Christ, and we forget about the billions of people who love Jesus just as much as you, and not just today throughout human history. Like I know we could be a little selfish. Like I want Jesus all to myself, and there's plenty of them to go around. He's a big God. He's a real big God. We serve Amen. a big God. Amen. Can we get if you listen in here? Amen. And I know it's Bible reading, but can we get an Amen there? Because. He is a big God and, and he's not stretched thin on his resources. I know sometimes we feel guilty praying for things. If we know that we're, we're blessed and saying, Lord, let your will be done in my life and watch over me. And we're like, man, you know what? There's people that need watching over more than me. And I feel guilty for that. Your God is not stretched thin. He is not like these false gods that has a, a limited amount of blessing to give, a limited amount of comfort and protection to give. He has enough protection and comfort to give to the lowliest of lowly and to you as well. Do not feel guilty yeah. for saying, Lord, give me my daily bread because you have daily bread. And be like, well, what about those people that don't? Pray for them as well. He yeah. says, um, arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Notice that this gift is a free gift, but he tells him, arise and walk. Right? It's it, people get so confused on works, be like, if a gift is given to you, it's not a work to, to grab the present and unwrap it. It's not a work to walk across the room and pick up the gift. It's not a work. It's you're not earning the gift because I took it from your hands. If I came to your house and handed you a present and then you took it from my hands and said, man, I worked hard for this. I'd slap you a little bit. So it's not a work when it talks about Abraham's faith was justified by his works. Cause what James was talking about was that his faith was made complete by his works. Cause God said, trust me and your trust will define your actions. He said, arise and walk. Abraham didn't say, well, no, God bring me Canaan, bring Canaan here and put it on my lap. <laughs> I love when I get a good laugh out of JD. Welcome to the Christian Ministry Bible reading. <laughs> I'm just going to have to mute myself, man, because I'm going to have to laugh this one out, man. <laughs> All right. Uh <laughs> you can. <laughs> so he had to mute himself. So Abram moved his tent. And came and settled by the oaks of Mem, and uh, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Notice also wherever Abram goes, he builds altars to the Lord. He gives God his place wherever he's at. Wherever I'm at, God, you can have part in my land. Uh, God already owns your land, right? It, it got, it's God's house. Your house is God's house. But do you give a place where you have that moment with the Lord? Some people have prayer closets. I wish I had the room for a prayer closet, but I have my areas that I go to that I give my time to the Lord. I got my little area in the corner where my massage chair is at. I got my area upstairs that I go and I have my alone time with the Lord. Abram gives him that location wherever he goes. And throughout the Old Testament, we see this all the time where people build altars to the Lord. Um, Anything you want to add to that, JD, once you're done dying over there? He's dying, guys, by the way. I can see him on camera. Y'all can't. I can. And he's still <laughs> over there. He's, he's fighting through it. He's fighting the good fight to get through this moment. Um, oh, I'm in so much pain right now. My stomach hurts so badly. That was that was just so... <laughs> man, like, I can just... I just picture this, like, naughty kid, like... <laughs> You bring me Canaan. <laughs> no, I don't want to go over there. You bring me Canaan. Exactly. That's what some oh, of these man. Christians today act like. Like, yeah. like God oh, built an ark for Noah. Like, here's an ark. Just get in it. Like, that's the picture yeah. a lot of people have. A lot of atheists have yeah. this picture of God that provides the ark, that puts the Canaan under you, that gives you, that builds the castle, that rebuilds the walls, that does all these things that he instructs us to do. And it's 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 oh, a man. lazy picture it's, of God. I think, I think that's the biggest reason why it's so funny is because it's made me so angry for so long that like now all I can do is laugh at it. Like like that's like literally that's that's all that's left to do is just you can just laugh at it because it's so ridiculous. 
What if exactly. what if we found out that the new earth and the new heaven are going to be built by us? There's probably Christians today that would be, be butthurt about that. I remember one time <laughs> I posted saying, um, what if I told you that there's work in heaven? And people said, no, there's not. Really? Because <laughs> if, if Eden is an image of heaven, Adam was working before the fall. So work is not a product of sin. So if work is not a product of sin, then that means work is going to exist for all eternity. Even Jesus said, my father is working in heaven, so I am working. When we're talking about the Sabbath, right? Uh, there's work in heaven. Now, it won't be by the sweat of the toil of my head, but heaven is not an eternal fishing trip. Heaven is not an eternal Netflix and chill. Heaven is not laying on the, on the, on the, uh, in the yard sitting in a lawn chair. Our God is a God of action. Nothing about God screams laziness in the Old Testament. And the opposite of that is true when it talks about laziness, which, oh, when we get to Proverbs, some of us going to be convicted. <laughs> Proper. That's conviction city, man. That's conviction city. Man, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's a spot on. The, the problem is people confuse working, <clears throat> working for your salvation and working to further the kingdom. You well, know, you know what they is, really confuse? They confuse working for God and working with God. Mm, there we go. Those are the words. That's it. I just couldn't articulate it in that moment. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Thank you, brother. Because that's, that's exactly for. it. People think, people think that when in the moment they're like, oh, you're backloading works, you're backloading works. And we're like, man, like, what? How did you get there? How did you take that leap? Like, how did you get there? Like, that's a giant leap from what I just said. I have not, it's got nothing to do with salvation. It's got everything to do with what he's done in me. Like, why wouldn't I? It's like you saying to me, hey, bro, like, here you go. Here's a free gun. Um, and here's free ammo. It's all yours. And then I take it from you. I'm like, well, now I can't shoot it because, you know, it's a gift. And I'm yeah, just I'm gonna, just going to hang it on the wall here. <laughs> yeah, with the ammo, you know, I'm just going to hang it's it an up. investment with no return of investment. He, he bought <laughs> you something and you're not using it. <laughs> amen, amen. Well, I see JD's enjoying sense. something yummy over there, so I'll keep reading. I was going to let him take over, but enjoy that yummy, <laughs> yummy, whatever you got there. I've got, I got two bites left. Okay, I'll, I'll cover. I, you know, I'll just I'll just sit here and repeat my words for a moment because you know I can talk my way out of a paper bag. Um, so we'll we'll buy you some time. But an important thing uh, uh, to note in Abram's life, though, again, and I just want to keep reassuring this is that he's not perfect, but he's he's trusting the Lord on his promises. And this is the common theme that we're going to see all throughout the Old Testament is it's about trusting the Lord. And this is why when we get to the New Testament, one of my favorite stories is Jesus in Nazareth. When he points to faith uh, being what matters, and he points to two pagans in the Old Testament to demonstrate that they had more faith than Israel had in those days. Because Israel starts to fall into this spoiled idea that I'm just chosen by God, and that's why I'm, I'm good. Like, people that think that the old... That, when I meet people that think that Jews thought they had to follow the law to be saved, it shows me they don't even know what they're talking about. The law was never about salvation. The, the people that kept the law, they kept, they, they kept it because they were the chosen people of God. They thought they were saved on that fact. It, it, whether you were really good at keeping the law or not, they believed that the reason they were special is because they were the chosen people of God. That they, that's where their pride was at, their arrogance that were at, because they thought they were this chosen people, which they were in a sense in the flesh. Uh, but it was to bring forth the redemption of mankind. But okay, yeah. JD looks like he's caught up. Go ahead, you can start at verse uh, one of chapter fourteen. Yep, Abraham rescues Lot. I mean, this is where the, the story really, the plot thickens, as they say. So, in the days of M. Raphael King. So, in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariel, king of Elasar, and Shedolalmer, king of Elam, and title king of Goim, or is that Goim? Goim, Goim, depending on your pronunciation. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, 
and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela. That is Zoa. I love that you keep having to do all these hard names. Yeah, man, you you really like you deep ended me tonight. It was like yo 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 swim, bro. <laughs> and all these joined forces in the Valley of Siddim. That is the Salt Sea. So again, <clears throat> I'm just gonna quickly quickly say this. All these what we see in brackets is is Moses saying, "Hey, remember that story? Are we yeah, we go. That was the Salt Sea, the Valley of Siddim there. So he's painting the picture for." Israel at the time. 12 years they had served Shedoloma, but the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year, Shedoloma and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shaveh. Kiria Tiam and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, modern day, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, the Amalekites. And also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined the battle in the valley of Sidim. When Chedor Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Geoim, and Aphraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. So here we see an epic battle taking place. <clears throat> now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them. And the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They took also Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. So oh. this just paints a picture of a epic battle. So I know that I have a map here that I want to show you guys. I went back to that slideshow real quick. So to help you guys get a visual visualization of what's happening here, let me find this map because I want you to see because a lot of that's probably going to be hard for you to you know, get with, right? So let's... Let's let's now cover a, a summary kind of of what we just read as we dive into the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So um, chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis introduction. Let me see where we're at right now. All right, here we go. So the facts we have about Abraham at this moment right now. So he was born in Ur around 2166 BC. Ur was a pagan city, worshipped the moon god, um, uh, his, which is Sin. Father's name was Terah. Terah was supposed to move the family to Canaan, but settled in Haran where he died. Abram. Uh, was commanded by God in Genesis 12, 1 to move on to Canaan. He obeyed at 75 years old. Abraham was being called to represent God to one of the most influential regions in the known area. Uh, his name was changed in Genesis 17. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of multitudes. Another little side note to remember is these names we're going to be going through in the Bible, the, the people that matter, I mean, not like genealogies, but his names have meaning behind it. Um, Abraham is seen as the fa father of the Hebrew people, which we're at, at literally about to get into. And then there was a covenant. Um, I have a map in here. Um, that is what I wanted to really show you. But we'll hit a couple of these other facts. What does the word patriarch mean? We've been talking about it. So patriarch means ruling father. It's the oldest member of every tribe. He has a high position of authority held by the father, extending to every aspect of life. Uh, the wife and all the children looked to him for guidance and judgment in all cases. Even after marriage, his children were subject to him as long as he lived. So this is a time when they, the patriarch, the old father, the wise man was the leader. Um, what are the features of the Hebrew people during the time of Abraham? Uh, they're nomadic people living in tents. They're moving frequently as grass was eaten. They are wealthy people. They're count they counted their wealth in gold, silver, flocks, herds, tents, jewels, and sons and daughters. Uh, they acquainted with the arts. 
Uh, they displayed the finest traits of Oriental culture, hospitality, and generosity. And their government was simple. Uh, in what city did Abram live when he was first mentioned? So city of Ar, like we met, Ur, like we mentioned, uh, is in the region of Mesopotamia. So the Mesopotamia area is the area of all this stuff that's happening in the Old Testament. There's a reason why all the religions that have similarities to Christianity are Mesopotamian, right? Because if the fallen angels are true and they were posing themselves as false gods, their stories would be very similar to the truth because they know the truth. After the death of his father, Terah, Abraham left for, with his wife, nephew, and other family members to Haran. They departed for the land of Canaan, the land of promise. Uh, there's two bibl other biblical names for the land, Palestine and the Holy Land. Uh, note they had no children when they left. Worst case scenario for a patriarch. So he had no one to pass his lineage to. Uh, what were the features of the promise that God gave Abraham? God said that he would give him a great nation. This was fulfilled as he was the father of the Hebrews. God would give him a great name. This is fulfilled, recognized among all religions. He, uh, he would be a blessing to all nations. This is fulfilled. The great gift of the Hebrew nation for the world uh, uh, lies in the realm of mortal, moral and spiritual. So we have Judeo-Christian values because of this people, uh, which has built the Western society. And then on a spiritual level, we get Jesus. And then he would receive a land for all his descendants. This is fulfilled. This was Canaan, which was which came finally through the birth of his son, Isaac. Um, the progression of Abraham's travels. Ur, Terah takes his family to Haran. And then from Haran, uh, the call comes to Abraham to finish the journey. Uh, Shechem, the first stop center of Canaan, builds altar remembering the promise. Bethel, 20 miles south, he pitched tents and built an altar to worship God. Egypt travels here due to famine, tells Sarai to pose as his sister. Back to Bethel, separation of Abraham and Lot allows, uh, allows Lot to choose his land. And then Hebron, where he establishes his home and spends the rest of his life. Here's the route of Abraham. Uh, you might have to screenshot this and zoom in. I, I understand. But as you see, he travels here from Ur. You can't really see my mouse. But then travels north and then goes uh, south to Egypt and comes back up and heads back to the promised land. Again, uh, some more pictures to help you see kind of where we're where this uh, trajectory was. Um, and we can go through some more of these slides after. I just wanted to hit that real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. Because what's about to happen, uh, we're about to dive into the first mentioning of the word Hebrew. Verse 13 says, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. Uh, now, let's look at the original language here, right? So let's look at this word Hebrew. So the word in Hebrew, it, the word in Hebrew for Hebrew is Ibri. And it is, uh, let me read down here, used to distinguish from foreigners. So it's used to, as a distinguishing um, of the people from beyond the Euphrates. Uh, in fact, in the name given in Canaan from beyond the Jordan. And that's basically it. it's a distinction between God's people and the people outside of God's people. So they are the Hebrews, the people that come from Abraham. He is. This is the very first moment, by the way, like I said, verse 13, the very first moment where we see the word Hebrew in scripture. So then it says, then one who escaped came in to Abram and told him who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eskel and of Anir. There, these were the allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, to, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. So I know we don't think about this often when we think about Abraham, but he was a warrior as well. He went into battle. He led men into battle and he conquered and brought back Lot. And it says, then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So he went in there and he, he slayed some bodies, right? And then stop mm. here. For a moment. We're about to have a little moment here where we, we get introduced to Mel Melchizedek, right? And this is, this is a point we get all the time. I don't know about you, baby. How often do you get asked about Melchizedek? Yeah. Yeah. Spam. Like often. So the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Remember, uh, we talked about it. So I just said it. Names mean something important. Um, and I'm going to read directly from a commentary a little bit about Melchizedek in this, in this moment here. 
uh, it says generally uh, Melchizedek generously provides a meal for the returning victors. Uh, Salem is possibly a shortened version of Jerusalem. See Psalm 76 two, and is related to Shalom. Uh, the Hebrew word for peace. He was priest of God most high. So we know that by saying most high, he's God of uh, the God most high. And again, because Abraham is the first of the Hebrews, anyone who existed at this time or prior can still fall into the group of people who still believe in the one true God and aren't part of that group, right? Israel isn't formed yet. So that's why we can say Job is existing at this exact same time, but Job's not an Israelite, but Job is connected to God and has, and there's priests around him, right? So this is still in that blending period where it goes from God being God of all humans to, to disowning the nations and having one nation, right? It just happened. And he's starting with um, Abraham. So Melchizedek, although he might not be uh, uh, shown as a part of the Hebrews, he is still a high priest of God. And the, the mm -hmm. commentary continues to read, Although very little is known of Melchizedek, he provides an interesting example of a priest king linked to Jerusalem. There appears to have been an ex ex expectation that later kings of Jerusalem should resemble him. You can see Psalms 110 verse 4. The book of Hebrews presents Jesus Christ from the royal line of David as belonging to the order of Melchizedek and therefore superior to the Levitical priests. So Levitical priests are going to come after Moses, but prior to Moses ever existing, we see this high priest, this Melchizedek, this high priest king, who's not just the high priest, but also the king. Because in the days of the law, we see the high priest and the king separate, right? David is, is the king, and then there's priests and whatnot. But Melchizedek represents a king priest. Um, where was I at? There it is. Uh, God Most High in Hebrew is El Elyon. Um, El is the common Semitic term for God, the, the singular. right? So Elohim, as we see throughout scripture, is plural for God. Now we, we see it written as God when speaking of our God because we know our God is one. But very interesting, if Elohim is used in any other context in the Old Testament other than talking about the Most High, it's translated to gods because it's actually a plural yeah. word. El is what means God. So El Elyon is God most high. And uh, like I said, El means God. To this is uh, added the attribute, uh, the attribute Elyon, meaning most high. Elsewhere in Genesis, other attributes are also added to El. Um, and we see this in Genesis 16, 13, God of seeing, which is El Ro, Roi. Uh, 17, 1, God Almighty, which is El Shaddai. Uh, 21, 33, Everlasting God, which is El Olam. Uh, these different names highlight different aspects of God's nature. And this is important to understand. This is why I make it clear, and people don't like this because we speak English and no one ever looks into this, but Elohim alone is not connected to our God. It is, but it's not synonymous, right? If you just say Elohim, that's not synonymous with our God. And there's a reason why every time the Most High is presented in Scripture, there's other attributes that come with it to separate him from any other Elohim. Because Elohim can be, be used for false gods. It can be used for lesser gods, like gods that aren't real God. So we always yeah. see the most high represented as the, the, the perfect most high, the beginning and the end, the most powerful, like all these other attributes that no one is like him. Um, and then the commentary continues saying Melchizedek's blessings, uh, Melchizedek's blessing attributes Abram's victory to the power of God by giving Melchizedek a 10th of everything. Abram affirms the truthfulness of Melchizedek's words, uh, uh, possessors of heaven and earth, Although God has created the whole earth to be his temple, Genesis reveals that God's ownership of the earth is rejected by those who do not obey him. Um, and in light of this, Melchizedek's acknowledgement of God's authority over earth is noteworthy. In marked contrast to Melchizedek's blessing, the king of Sodom's remarks are surely and small-minded. He expressed no gratitude. He dishonors Abram and this ominous of the light. So there's as much as we know about Melchizedek, and we could honestly talk about this for hours, but I wanted to go to the commentary on that. I wanted you to hear that directly from biblical scholars as we continue. And with that, I'll let uh, uh, J.D. take back over because he's been doing translations all day. I mean, not translations, names. So here's some cool meat for him to chew on. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that, brother. Absolutely awesome. Verse 17 
after his return from the defeat of Che Che Dor Lomar, Lomer, depending on pronunciation as always, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. This is the first we see of that covenant of the, the tithe. And we see Abraham giving a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. Ooh, and that's the I think there's something really the cool to note right there, JD. And I might be realizing this for the first time. Um, that's why I love doing this with you. Um, notice how later in, in the New Testament, it says to pay your debts and, and not be uh, uh, beholden to anyone, right? And we see mm -hmm. Abram doing this right here, saying, I want nothing of yours. I just want what God offers me because I'm not about to be holding to you. I'm not about yeah. to have you be able to say, I made Amen. it. No, I want all the glory to go to God. And I love Amen. that because if you look through the Bible, God never uses people that can uh, accredit something to someone else, right? Uh, 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 even with Moses, Moses was a, a Pharaoh's uh, prince, right? If God used him right there, anybody could have looked at that and been like, oh, well, look, Moses was able to do what he did because he had power, he had position, he had ability, he had all these things. But God let him lose all that first so that God could be the one that clearly did it. People say, you know, why does God let people suffer? So that it can be clear that God brings joy. It can be clear that Amen. God makes strong the weak. It says he will use the weak to show his strength. He will use the poor to show his richness. Use the, the, the not smart, the unintelligent to show his intelligence, right? The fools to show his intelligence. I mean, I use me for an example. I can speak about myself. I'm a high school dropout. But yet I get people that say, Mike, I wish I could be as smart as you. Smart as what? I'm not smart. I was a high school dropout. I was disobedient. I was a wretched man. I was a sinner. I was an addict. I, 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 I was nothing. God's power is magnified in my weakness. And, and, and here we have uh, uh, Abram saying, no, it's all God. And, and Melchizedek Amen. affirmed that, saying, blessed be the, God, uh, the hand of God most high, who delivered you out of, uh, into your hand, right? Or delivered your enemies into your hand. And he's saying, it's all God. I give all credit to God. I want nothing from you. But we live in a society nowadays where we're like, Girl, hey, yo, take your blessing. If they want to bless you, take your blessing, right? If I try to do this in today's society, right? If I went and I preached a gospel <laughs> message somewhere, and let's say I preached this gospel message and someone came up and said, yo, we, uh, for someone from the world, right? Someone like from, I don't know, I'm just going to pick a big company like Twitter. Like uh, Elon Musk comes to me and says, we want to pay you to book because we love that all these people are happy. Like, no, nah, I, I no, nah, because then people can look at it and be like, look what Elon did. Look what Twitter did, right? I'm making up an example, so it might not make perfect sense as far as why would Elon do that. But my point is, people would say, well, no, let him bless you. That's the Lord. No, no, no. The Lord knows how to bless me. It, he can do it. I, I'm not about to be holding to anyone. That's why I love the, the, the position God has even put me in, because I don't need anything from anyone. I'm at a perfect spot in my life where I'm good with everything God gives me, so no one can... Uh, try to wrap me up in a need for money or a need for views or a need for following. Don't let anyone have that control over you. Put your yeah, trust amen. in him. What time, what do we have on time? Do we have time? To open yeah, that's, that's an hour and 35. We should, we should wrap it up before we start the next one. Okay. 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 Oh, oh, oh so you have time to continue. Cause remember I can edit. So you have time to continue uh, uh, going. Yeah, we can. Is, we can do is, another. What does your time look like on your side? It's nine thirty in the evening. No, I meant like, <laughs> how much time do you have? What do you What are you predicting that you have left? 
uh, probably like 40, 40 or so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you said you want, well, there's no point in starting a new episode. Let's do one more chapter. We'll, we'll somehow keep this five chapters going. I don't know how we've been able to keep five chapters going, especially this one. We did so much other stuff, but let's do one more chapter. Yeah. I'll cut this part out. And then, um, then we can go ahead and wrap this episode up. And then I will work on editing episode one tonight just to get it ready to go tomorrow. And we'll be uploading. I think we're at a place where we can upload uh, episode one tomorrow. So for those watching on TikTok right now, because um, I can, we're we're kind of taking a break from this right now because I'm gonna have to edit this part out. Um, yeah, we'll definitely yeah. do that. And then so when this, you this and I finish, two. yeah, yeah and when when you and I finish, what I'll do is I'll hop over to uh, this live stream and just uh, you know chat with them for a minute just to you know, keep them aware of what's coming and, and maybe answer any questions that they might have had from listening to us. But yeah, I'm down. Oh, Let's cool. go into the covenant from Abraham or the covenant from God to Abram. Sweet. All right. All right. We're going to go back to Mike. So future Mike, um, I know you're listening to this as you're planning to edit it. First of all, I love you. Don't forget that. Man, and you're an awesome, fine. you're an awesome person, Mike. Uh, I'm just joking. Uh, but uh, don't forget to do the things that you have to do and don't forget to edit this properly. But uh, this is One where you're going to want to, this is where you're going to want to cut it. Yeah, one, one hour 35. That's your that's your mark. One hour 36 and seven seconds. <laughs> that's your mark. And go. <clears throat> All right, so now we have... Oh, okay, 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 okay. Starting here. All right, so where do we have ourselves at now? So now we have uh, uh, these people in these nations uh, causing issues and, and, and just straight up taking over land. And we see Sodom and Gomorrah being a victim here, right? So they were a victim of this. They had their possessions taken. Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was in these locations and this king comes forth and, and, and he's thankful in a sense, I guess you could say for Abram, but at the same time, he doesn't give grace to God the way Abram does, right? So Abram is blessing the God most high for delivering him. And this man's worried about his possessions and, and these things. And Abram's like, nah, I'm with God. I'm not really worried about you. You can have all your stuff. I don't want nothing from you. So then we get to God, uh, God having a covenant with Abram. So chapter 15, it starts with, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. I want you to notice something that we've maybe pointed out, but you really need to hear this now. You are going to notice that the Old Testament has a way to distinctly emphasize the word of the Lord and then also the angel of the Lord. Now, remember, the word angel in Hebrew is malach, which just, mean, which just means messenger. And the angel of the Lord is the messenger of Yahweh. And this messenger of Yahweh, as we're going to learn in Exodus later on, that he is different than any other angel. In fact, this messenger of the Lord, it says, uh, uh, I'm giving you a little foreshadowing. Moses is told by Yahweh, uh, be careful to abide by his words because he will not forgive you for my name is in him. Right. So this angel of the Lord has the authority of God to not forgive someone and is his representation on earth. This is why people believe that the angel of Yahweh is the pre-incarnate Jesus, because in John chapter one, it says anyone who has seen God has actually seen Jesus. Right. So and we know that Jesus is the word of God. So notice again, it says, and the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So it's vi it's visual. It's not audible. I mean, yes, obviously audible plays a part with anything you see, you also hear. But I want you to be aware that it's not saying that God's words appeared in, in Abraham's head. So where he he knows what God is saying is the word of the Lord here is an entity. It's an existence. And it came to him in a vision. So he saw the word of the Lord. Remember what me? you hear it? This is also the first time that we see Abram seeing God. So God has spoken to Abram in the past, but now he sees God. And when he sees God, he's actually seeing what? The word of the Lord. Man, if your head didn't just go Trinity. Um, and, and the word yeah. of the Lord says to him, fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Who is our rock? Who is our refuge? Jesus. Your reward shall be great. But Abram Amen. said, O Lord God. So he says to him, O Yahweh Elohim. So he literally looks upon the word of the Lord and says, God. So the word of the Lord is God. So John's not making stuff up when he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You can see the same thing in Genesis 15 verse one <laughs> before Abraham was, I am. And here's Amen. the word of the Lord appearing to Abraham saying, fear not Abraham. I am your shield. Actually, 
fun, fun, interesting uh, research topic I'm about to do right now. Um, okay, just looking at some Hebrew there. I wanted to see if something happens. Um, he says, but Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heirs of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So Abram isn't even thinking about money or riches or blessings. He's like, Lord, I need a child to pass on my lineage, which goes hand in hand with what JD and I were talking about off air, which we're going to possibly talk about in an episode soon. This is unrelated to you because you might be listening to this whenever, but we have changed our view of how we view children today. Children is a burden to society. Look at Abram here saying, Lord, what the only thing I could ever need is a child, an heir, someone to pass on what I have and to teach and to raise. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to, the, uh, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Let's look at this now. This isn't the first time that this is not the first time that God and Abraham have had an had an inter, an interaction. Uh, Abraham has listened to God and obeyed God, uh, and his actions are evident already. But his actions didn't make him righteous, for he did what God told him to do, and that did nothing towards his righteousness. It is only here where where Abraham is doubting God, saying, "God, I need an offspring." He says, "I got you," and he says, "I believe you," and then in that moment. He actually trusts God will keep his promise and his righteousness is accounted to him. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. You're going to notice that a lot of times God reminds us of what he's already done for us when he makes promises to us to show us there's nothing you can do to earn this promise. I've been acting all this time. I've already been contributing yeah. to you this whole time. This, this isn't about you doing anything for me. I'm the God who delivered you from Ur. What does he tell Moses? Before the commands are given, before he even gives the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God that brought you out of Egypt. I've already been acting in this relationship. Now let me give you some guidance. He said um, uh, 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 to give you to this land uh, you're possess to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And that when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will mm. bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possession. Obviously, we're, mm. we're talking about Egypt here. Um, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. We also see here uh, uh, the first mention of an afterlife. Notice we haven't seen this yet, but he says you will go to your fathers. So you will be with them when you are uh, when you are buried in your good old age, which is Sheol. And again, this is the beginning of the Bible reading. We're going to hear a lot of these terms a lot. This is the introduction to it. This is where you're going to first learn it. And then it gets taught more and expounded upon. Um, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made go. a covenant with Abram saying Bam. to your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the per per uh, Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, 
and the Jebusites. And yeah, uh, side note, the Raphaim are descendants of the Nephilim, um, which we read about in uh, uh, Deuteron either Deuteronomy or Exodus. So we'll get there as well. And there it is to this day, to this day, the location of that place stands firm. God Amen. doesn't go back on his word, not ever. Amen. Not ever. Absolutely. And man, am I looking forward to the next couple chapters? So if you are watching this with us, if you have been watching this with us, make sure that you hit subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when the next episode comes out. Because man, Amen. we're about to get into uh, one of the most beautiful foreshadows of Christ and also one of the very first like clear pictures of the redemption of mankind and the love of God. We're going to get into some amazing imagery where we see the Trinity in the Old Testament. We're going to get into God's wrath, God's blessings. Genesis is an amazing story. We thank you so much for being here. We'll see you on the next episode. And as always, God bless and go in peace. Go in peace.